So, this is November 2022, and the beginning of this year, beginning of next year, we'll be going into our 16th year, 16 years building guns for other people. And the interesting thing is, we have received thousands of phone calls, thousands of phone calls, thousands of emails. Now, we were just talking about this, and that's why we themed this elk. Can you guess what the number one topic is? It is not cartridges or bullets or guns or it's elk. The number one thing people call me up and talk to me about is elk. And I guess, you know, because we're elk hunters and we've shot a lot of elk and been with a lot of people that have shot a lot of elk and we live in elk country. is actually elk and then of course it is it's it's what cartridge to use for elk it's what's what bullet they want to use it's what gun they're gonna build how you know how physically big it's gonna be what they're gonna use for it what they're gonna use for use it for how they're gonna use it's what I meant to say in other words whether they're gonna pack it on their back whether it's going on llamas whether it's going on horses whatever however they're gonna use it but then of course they want to talk about scopes they want to talk about range finders. They want to talk about backpacks. They want to talk about all kind of stuff. But you know what's really very interesting is in all of those years, 15 years, approximately, approximately 5,000 phone calls and or emails. You want to know what the number one subject that nobody has ever even mentioned. Never mentioned. Care to guess? Well, physical fitness. Nobody has ever called me up and said, well, I'm going on a, I'm going on, I have a, I have a big elk hunt plan, say to Idaho, and I'm going to be in the back country and it's do it yourself. And how good a shape do you think I should be in? Nobody has ever done that. Not, not one single time. In fact, I can't think of a single time anybody even mentioned anything about physical fitness at all. Like, it's like it's not even even a consideration, which to me, that puts everything backwards. And, and, and I gotta digress just for a second. I always have to do that, right? So I'll have, out of those 5,000 people that call me up, 5,000 people that call me up or email me about rifles, everybody, well, how much is it gonna weigh? How much, or, you know, how much, how much, how light a gun can you build and build, say, a 338 Lapua. Can you build a 338 Lapua, shoot 300 grain bullets in a seven pound gun? It's like, yeah, I can do that. You don't want to shoot it, okay? But they seem to miss the point. Who cares how heavy the gun is? That's not the issue. The issue is, is how good a shape are you in? So if you have two guys, all else being equal, say they have equal rifles, equal shooting ability, equal knowledge, equal, equal drive, equal everything, everything being equal, they're both 40 years old. One of them can run a 10 minute mile and one of them can run a six minute mile. Which one do you think 
has the greater, greater chance of coming out of the woods with a nice six-point bull. Well, let me tell you, I guarantee you the guy who's in better shape, the, the six-minute mile guy can come out, has a better chance of coming out with a big bull than the 10-minute 10, 10 mile guy. And, and, you know, here's the thing. 10-minute mile for a 40-year-old guy is not that bad. Okay, that's not horrible. There are a lot of guys trying to go in the woods that probably couldn't run a 15-minute mile. The thing about hunting elk in, on public ground in the backcountry is it's rough. It's rough. It's, and sometimes it's even brutal. So the deal is the more time and energy you put into training, the greater the chances that you'll actually be coming out of the woods with a bull. Because, you know, if you, if you just can't do what is required to be done, then your odds go down. So, you know, we have horses. A lot of people would be like, well, you guys have horses. Yeah, we have horses. Very, very rarely do we get to ride them. Almost always we are leading them. <clears throat> and the reason for that is because we don't want to take 10 horses. I can't move 10 horses. In other words, with one truck and one trailer, you can only move so much gear. If you have two trucks, two trailers, you know, two, two basically, two guys with all the stuff they need, then sometimes, yes, you can ride. But if you're gonna ride, say you got two to ride and four to pack, well, that's, that's moving six horses. Six horses and all their gear, that's a lot of stuff to move into the backcountry. So a lot of times we are walking. That What that means is, we don't have to carry big backpacks, but we still generally have our day pack on with all our survival gear, and then we're walking. And a lot of times, like where we park the truck to where, say, we're going to put in, say, our first camp, because a lot of times we move around now because of the wolves. You know, you got to find the elk. I mean, we might walk, I don't know, what do you think, Vicky? Six, five, six, seven hours from the truck in one day to wherever we're gonna put our first camp. Oh yeah. Right, and I mean, so it, it's a lot of walking, and so the better shape you're in, the better it is. And then of course too, if you do kill an elk, there's no guarantee you're gonna be able to get a horse to it. I mean, that that is a luxury. Being able to shoot a bull and lead a horse up to it, even within 50 yards of it, is a big luxury. So a lot of times you're gonna to have to take those quarters, put them on your shoulders, and you might have to hump that thing half a mile, maybe even a mile. You know, depending on where you're going to need to get it, that you can get the horses too. I say all that to say that the better shape you're in, the higher your odds are of coming out of the woods with a bull. Now, I don't know whether you guys know this or not, but Vicki used to compete in figure and fitness. And right here, this is where she's going to stick in a bunch of, a bunch of her contest photos. She used to be in absolutely outstanding shape. What's your best mile time ever? Six? Six minute mile? Something. Six something, six something right. My best all time ever, and, I, and this is burned into my brain, is 514. I ran a 514 mile on a track in shorts on a beautiful summer day after spending an entire summer trying to get to 513, which I could not do, by the way. I wanted to run a four minute mile so bad, I just couldn't stand it. All I wanted was a 459. But I just, I simply could not do it. I mean, I pushed and pushed and pushed. But you gotta understand, I wasn't six foot two and 150. I was six foot 200. And that's, that's a lot to move around the track at that speed. I'm not making excuses, but I just couldn't do it. So she's somewhere in the sixes. I was somewhere, you know, not somewhere, 514. The deal is though, she could run, how many miles do you think you could run without stopping? six, seven, eight, nine, ten miles yeah. without stopping. I mean, and, and she could just basically leave me in the dust. And when I first met her, I could outclimb her on the hills, but as Not far as just long. running down the road, what's that? <laughs> Not for long. Yeah, well, okay. We're, there's ten years difference between us, okay? But then something else also happened is Vicki got cancer, nearly died. At one point, an oncologist only gave her 60 days to live. He came in and said, get your crap ready, you'll be dead in 60 days. Well, that was seven years ago. And I had, let's see, how do we gotta say this? We always gotta say this. I had China plague so bad that I almost didn't make it. And that was about a year and a half ago. So 
we've had major set, major health setbacks, but we continue to train. Now, whenever Vicky was doing contests, we literally trained six, seven days a week, year round, and we always rotated. So like Monday, we would say run, and Tuesday, we would lift weights, and Wednesday, we would sprint, and Wednesday, we would lift weights, whatever. We were always rotating. Well, now that we're old and sick, we do things a little bit different. We literally now are dividing the year into halves. So we spent, as soon as last winter ended, as soon as you can get outside, so we're walking, we're running, we're sprinting, and we're climbing the mountains. We got really big mountains all around here, and I mean, we can get out of the truck at 1,500 feet, and an hour later be standing at 6,000 feet. We got big hills here. So that's, that's what we did all summer long this year. We have not touched a weight. We have not touched a barbell or a dumbbell in, what, six months? Yeah. At least. So here's where we're at this year. Right now, we are probably at our very best aerobically, I would say, probably, wouldn't you? Yeah, we're good. Okay, and we are probably at our very worst strength-wise. So we're pretty dang weak. We're going back to training now. It is now winter here, like I mentioned. It is November, and it, we have snow on the mountains, and it's starting to be crappy weather here. So what we do now is we're going to completely switch. We're going to drop almost all the aerobic stuff, and we're going back to strength training. And we've always kept logs for years and years and years. I have logs. I have stacks of log books literally that high that I can go back and look and see. So when I was 35 years old, I could bench press 225 pounds for 10 reps. I can just go back and look, and I don't know whether that's right or not. But I can go see what I could do. So what we try to do is we try to go back to our old personal records and try to beat those personal records. Now you got to realize that was 30 years ago. I'm 61, and Vicky's yeah, 10 years younger than I am. The deal is, it's very hard. The only reason I'm even saying all this and why we titled this elk is, if you wanna to come to the West, if you wanna hunt public ground, if you wanna do it yourself, you're gonna go into the backcountry and you want to kill a six point or better bull, an honest to gosh, 350 inch or bigger bull, the better shape you're in, the better the odds of your success. So what we're gonna start doing is, because we have a lot of videos, a lot of gun building videos, which that's coming in the same video. We're gonna start putting little pieces of physical fitness videos, tack them onto here, so that you can kind of see where we're at and you can kind of see our progress. Now, if we get nine million comments that say, I don't wanna watch you jumping rope or doing bench pressing, well then we'll take them out. But if people are like, hey, it would be interesting to see how good can an old man how good can I get and how good can a woman who, who nearly died? Two, Vicky had a tumor in her chest that big, that thick. They couldn't even see her heart, okay? They could not see it on CAT scans. It was growing on into CTs. my heart. Pardon me? It was growing into my heart. Yes, it actually had tentacles growing into her heart. And that's why they're like, you're dead. You're not going to live. Well, here it is, seven years later. And the reason why is it's kind of weird. These things tie together is... We want to keep going hunting even though we're old. To keep going hunting, we have to stay in shape. So what we did is we took her sickness and my sickness as motivation. Like, you know, this kind of, you know what motivation. We're going to live and we're going to keep going hunting. So we're going to start splicing some of this stuff in and we're just going to show it to you. You put it in the comments whether you like it or not. So again, we're, going to, we're only doing two things on camera tonight because we got a, a lot of video coming up over there at the lake. Vicky's going to jump rope for one minute, all out, hard as she can go. I'm going to do it on the stopwatch. She'll be watching. Go ahead and show them. She'll be watching that clock up on the wall. Whenever she's done, I'm going to do one minute all out. Then she's going to do push-ups, flat ground push-ups, and I'm going to do incline push-ups. Remember, we haven't done any strength training, all aerobics. So here we go. Okay, you tell me when. When you say, actually, I'll start the clock okay. whenever the jump rope hits the floor the first time, okay? Okay. Okay.
30 seconds. One minute. All right, switch me. You have any idea? I, I lost track. You have any idea how many? No. All right, here's the stop watch. There. You need to be over there. Okay, I'm gonna go much faster. Hi. Ready? Tell me when. Actually, just do the same thing. The okay. second that the rope hits. Ready? Yep. Seven seconds. Okay. He almost made it. Stop that thing, son. <sighs> All right. So here we are. So she's gonna do flat, flat push-ups. <clears throat> Come on. You can do better than that. Come on, 200 more. <laughs> Come on, keep going. All right. Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm horrible. <laughs> well, look at me. Uh, turn the camera upside down. Like I said, we're in our weakest. <laughs> we're in our physically weakest. So let's find out, see how many I can do. <clears throat> Okay. That was good. That's it. All right, so we're gonna have updates like this. Assuming you guys wanna see them every so often, I would like to get back to doing 100 what you just saw. But that'll be five months from now. We'll see what kind of progress we make. All right. Okay, enough with the foolishness and back to work. Um, I've been building a 300 WSM here, 300 WSM bench gun, and a unique, not unique, it's not unique to me, but a unique situation came up. Actually, I shouldn't say that, it's not unique. What it is, is it's a very teachable moment, very teachable moment, and it just, it wasn't planned, that's just the way that it came up. And so what I'm gonna do here is, I'm gonna show you something that probably most people don't understand. But before I get into it, before I get into the actual uh, meat and potatoes of this, I'm going to show you what this is. So normally we're using a bat and of course here we are we're using a bat. The one difference about this is this is a bat VR. This is right bolt, left port, solid bottom, single shot. This at the moment, it has an ejector in it. I think there's another bolt coming without an ejector, but that's, that's a whole other story. So we're building it on a bat VR, like I said, right, right bolt, left port. Um, we we're using a Brux 1 and 11. Um, it was inch 345 at the breech. It was um, 1.00 at the muzzle, inch at the muzzle. It was a 30 inch long blank. Again, as normal, we're using the Macmillan stock. I believe this is, I think this is either McWalnut or, no, yeah, this is. This is McWalnut, three inch wide forearm. I can't remember what model number this is. Um, pretty nice stock. This is solid fill. When you order stocks, you know, you can get standard fill, sniper fill, 
solid fill. All that all that's going on is is how much fiberglass is getting in it. This is a heavy stock. This is going to be a fairly heavy gun. I, again, I, when it's finished, I don't know. I bet I'm guessing it. 13, 14, 15, somewhere in that. And by the way, they inletted it. Right bolt, left port. Left, left bolt, bolt removal button. Um, and of course, it hasn't been bedded or anything. This is just the way they sent it to us. So we're only in the preliminary stages here. So here's where we're at. I want to bring the camera over here. I want to show you something. So I'd say come around on this side so they can see better. So what we have here is, you know, we have the barrel in the lathe, everything's been indicated, blah, blah, blah. Um, I turned a tenon and then threaded it, okay? And so where we're at here is the receiver, the receiver goes on, and there's something I wanna show you right here, I probably showed it before, but I barely threaded that on. There is zero movement. Zero movement, there's a hair, little bit of, little bit of tang wiggle right there, but that goes away as you bring it up. There has to be a little bit of clearance or it won't go on, okay? So you bring it around, and there, it comes up tight. And I can't really get down in there and show you, but it's, it's the shoulder to receiver junction is just about as good as it can possibly be. When, when it, when, if there's like a, a, a hairline, a gray line there that you can see when you back it off, and as you bring it up, it just begins to look like it's one piece of steel. Now I'm gonna do something here to, just as a reference point so that you guys can see what I'm talking about. And so I'm gonna just put a line right here, okay? So that you can see, that's where it comes up, watch. And it, it's, you can't, you literally can't move it. Once they bump together on two perfectly mated surfaces like that, I mean, sometimes it's pretty hard to get them back apart. You know, this is still has a lot of oil on it. You gotta be careful if the tenon is dry and the receiver is dry and you've cut the threads this close, you have to be careful that they don't go together. Um, and there's a whole, I wanted, there's something else I wanted to talk about. I was on somebody else's, some other gun builder, gun builder, YouTube website, whatever, YouTube page, and there was a bunch of guys going back and forth to whether you build to spec or you build to fit. I'm a huge proponent of build to fit. So that, you know, when you, when you buy a receiver, at least when you buy a receiver off the bat, they send you, a, you know, what's basically a print, all the dimensions. So, you know, here's your head space, here's your shank length, this is what it is, plus there, and it's actually this row over here, because this is above, it's at, we're working out of this line, not out of this line. This is, I can't see. This is VR01 to 999. After that, they change the dimensions. But anyway, so what you've got here is you got a, a shank length of 772 plus or minus 3000. All right, well, if you're just cutting things to spec, it is a million times faster. It is absolutely a million times faster. So say you just looked on air and you're like, okay, I'm gonna turn the tenon diameter to 772. Well, by doing that, you absolutely know that it's gonna fit. Everything is gonna fit. That's not gonna be a problem. But what you're not gonna get is a perfect fit. And I'm, I'm always going for the perfect fit. So I'm a big proponent of cut to fit, not cut to spec. And that, that would be a whole entire video. The deal is, when you do it right, like this, when this comes up on here and stuff, there is zero movement. I mean, this thing, it, it says, it says one piece of steel. Okay, so I wanna show you something though. So here's the bolt. And so it goes in, right? When you're cutting that tenon, Without, this isn't, that, that's not even what this video is about. But when you're cutting that tenon, as you're coming up on it, I cut the tenon too long, you'll push the bolt in and it won't go down, right? Because the tenon itself is hitting onto the face of the bolt. And I get within about, oh, maybe 20 thousandths. And actually, you know, by measuring. But then what I do is, is I screw the receiver on and I put the bolt in and it won't go, right? Because Again, the, ten, the end of the tenon is hitting the face of the bolt. And what I do is, is I'll take like two thou, 
I'll take two thou and I put the bolt back in, it won't go. And I'll take like two more thou and I put the bolt in and it won't go. And as I get down to where I'm thinking I'm getting down to like five thou, there's only five thou more to go, then I'll only take like one thou. So I'll take a pass, one thou, I'll come back in, it won't go. And what I really, really like is when I'm doing this, is on that last pass, say I'll get down to what I think is one thou. I'm assuming that I got one thou more to go and I'll take a half a thou, which is super cool when you could hit it dead on. So I'll take a half a thou and I'll come in here and the bolt will go halfway down. Okay, it's like it just started, but it won't. Well, okay, it's really great then because you know you take the back in, you take the next half a thou, which is crazy, half a thou, and the bolt falls. Okay, so now it's basically at zero. There's no tolerance, no clearance between the end of the tenon and the face of the bolt. Now, there has to be some. Okay, you can't, you can't build a gun with zero tolerance because it won't function. You remember that you have to torque this, torque this receiver on. But what it does is it gives me a true zero. In other words, I know exactly what the real zero is. And then what I'll do is, is I'll just look up at the DRO and I usually take, depending on what type of a gun it is, what it's going to be used for, hunting gun, Ventress gun, etc., I'll take three to five thousand. And that's it. And, and I'll do it in one pass. So say it's going to be a bench gun, and I take three thousands in one pass, and then I know that I have exactly three thousands clearance between the end of the tenon and the face of the bolt. Okay, now, you got to realize that some of that gets taken up. Again, whenever this goes, when you thread this on there and you tighten it on, it's going to move forward a little bit. And across the whole industry, everybody figures it's going to take about one thou. But you know what I've found out is when you have a bat receiver, when you have a large diameter barrel, when all of your mating surfaces are square and, and concentric with each other, etc., it usually doesn't take up that much. It usually hits and it goes maybe half a thou. So if you built three thou into it and then you tighten it up, it takes half a thou, you got two and a half thou clearance on the thing. Which by the way, that's usually not enough for a hunting gun. But, but, I'm telling you all that just to show you this. Okay, so once all that is done, here, watch. Once you have all these dimensions right, then of course the next thing is, is to cut the chamber. Now again, lots of people do this in lots of different ways, and there's a whole bunch of people on there right now that are showing literally built, making videos showing people how to do things. It's not the way I do it. That's all I'll say about that. But this is the reamer right here. This is a Dave Manson reamer. That's what we use almost exclusively all these years later. I, I haven't bought anything but a Dave Manson probably in 10 years. Our reamers are finished reamers. This is a live pilot reamer right here. It's in a Dave Manson floating holder, etc., etc. I'm not going to go into all that. That's not what this is about. But the deal is, you start, you start cutting the chamber into the barrel. And as you do it, you know, at the beginning, you, you know that you're going to end up somewhere way back here. Okay, it's, it's very easy to see. Here's the headspace gauge. So all you got to do is hold it up against there, and you know how much you got to take. You got to take a whole bunch at the beginning. So you go in there and you start knocking all that out. By the way, I do not pre-drill. I do not use roughing reamers. I use the finish reamer, and there's a reason for that. Again, I'm not going into it. Um, you start working up on it, and again, I've done this. I've built so many guns now that you know I can tell when I'm getting close. I mean, I, I can usually just freehand it, just eyeball it to within fifty thousandths, no problem. And so, but as you get closer you start to put your, your headspace gauge in there and you see where you're at, right? So if the headspace gauge is sticking out like that, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to do it, but you can just measure from the face of, face of the, you can measure from the shoulder or the face, whatever. You measure how much is sticking out here and you know how far you gotta go. So if it's sticking out like that, you know you gotta go half an inch. If it's not like, out like that, a quarter of an inch, you know, you get in here and you start measuring to where you need to be. All right. So you're slowly working up on it, right? So, but as you get, you know, once you get under 50 thousandths, 
you got to start paying attention to what you're doing. And after I get under 50,000, usually I am taking like, the next pass will probably be like 10,000, then 10,000. Once I get down to 10, I really start to pay attention. Now, be before I go on and tell you what I was going to say is, I was showing you this here. This is a, this is a Dave Manson 300 WSM in this QMM go gauge, okay? And there's the date. I've had that since way back in 2013.